welcome to episode 12 of what we're now officially calling Kitsis and Carl. Michael, welcome. It's good to be here. Uh, well, welcome back. Round, round 12. Like, I don't even think I can say round anymore. Like, it was sort of a round one, round two, round three. I think we're now past the point of boxing matches and, like, things that you record with. <laughs> With rounds, and I guess it really, it's, it's not like, it's not Kitz's verse Carl. <laughs> like, it's a boxing match. Yeah, it's yeah. Kitz's and Carl. So, we're, I, I think I'm just going to have to go with episodes now. We're just going to go with episodes. Episode 12. So, here's what we're going to do today. You sent out a message on, I like to call it a toot. You sent out a toot on Twitter, because um, I have such a hard time saying tweet. You sent out a toot. You tooted on Twitter. And you said, uh, market commentary, what do you send your clients? Anybody have any good ideas? So talk to me. What happened after that? Yeah, well, so I guess I even need to give a little context leading in. Uh, like, I had asked this because I've had a couple of questions coming in lately from advisors. I think this whole pressure of, like, got to say more to clients, got to be in front of more clients, got to have higher touch to clients had a bit of market volatility a few months ago. So like, I think there's a general pressure out there for feeling like we need to do more to stay in touch. So I'm, I'm hearing more of these questions of sending stuff to clients, sending market commentary to clients. And I realized, so you know, back in the old world, the old world, my old world, in like early broker-dealer days, um, we has, used to have two old platforms that we did for this. One was called Ketley Backroom Technician. I don't even think it's around anymore. It got like bought and consolidated from someone else, but it had all these like pre-printed explainers of like how did revocable living trusts work and how did term life insurance work and how did a whole life insurance work? Like just all these really handy client friendly educational explainer tools. And then there was this sister package called four field advisor, which is now owned by Broadridge where you could get things like market commentary newsletters and like back then i mean it was it was newsletter like i was with the firm that bought this and we paid and the printing costs to mail it to people and like the goal of networking meetings was to actually get business cards with addresses so you could pull the address off and mail them a four field advisor market commentary quarterly newsletter so okay. I'm getting these questions like, what do people send out for market commentary today to so realize, like, I don't really know. I know Fourfield is actually still out there. Broadridge bought them a couple of years ago, but that package is still out there. I was just thinking, like, I, I don't know what people are actually sending anymore as market commentary for clients. So I put this message out on Twitter. I, I tooted it on Twitter. I, I don't know if I can stick with that, Carl. I tweeted that on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and and put the and put the question out just asking the question and kind of kicked off a really interesting conversation and response that was a lot more than just people responding here's what i use here's what i use although we got a little of that as well okay wait we gotta back up because here's what i'm curious about before we get into like the actual question that you asked i'm curious about the thing that generated the question so you know you said you'd been hearing from people and advisors are feeling this way. Let's, let's just, I, I'd really like to dive into that for a minute. I didn't expect okay. it, but I'm curious about like, what problem are we trying to solve by sending stuff out and how do we know it's a problem? It's a good question. I mean, I, I, as, as I would think about it, I mean, we do a version of this, in our firm as well, frankly, uh, we we create our own stuff internally because we've got a dedicated investment team. We're not using third party materials, but I, I mean, I'll answer this on behalf of us. I think we send it out for a couple of reasons. One is just, you know, we have a subset of clients that actually have questions like stuff's going on in the markets. What do you guys think about that? Uh, and while we can have those conversations one at a time with clients, we do have those conversations one at a time with many clients. There's just a certain level of efficiency to say, here's where our investment team's thinking about that stuff. We'll send it out to clients and know full well that a big chunk of them won't read it. 
which is fine. The ones that want to will read it and we get an opportunity to answer their questions either when they were about to ask them anyways or right before they ask them. Because we've got some clients that do track what's going on in markets and genuinely want to know, what are you thinking about this? What are you doing about this? What's your take on this? And so we set out our market commentary. Here's our take. So, but my question is, um, yeah, here's what I'm actually really curious about. Did we create this monster, right? Do how many did we, and by we, I mean the whole traditional financial services industry, the, the, the circus, the financial pornography network, the good, the good people, the bad people, like the whole lot of us, nobody was born thinking they needed a quarterly investment commentary or a monthly newsletter. Nobody was born thinking that. Did we create this problem? And the question I have is, is this a problem in our heads? Or is it a real problem? And, and we may end up having to spend our whole episode on that, and then we can talk about the actual result of Twitter, because I think there's a really useful conversation around this. I, you know, I, yes and no. Um, I, I don't think it's solely this, like, demon that we created for ourselves, this cross that we put on our shoulders that now we have to bear. There are a subset of clients. Well, look, so there, there's a subset of clients that are, I guess I'll try, call them like the true delegators, like the ideal delegators, the perfect clients. Like they give you all their money and they don't call. It's wonderful when we get those. We all know how to service those. But right. then there's a lot of other clients that are at least a little more involved. And like the realization I've had is, is going through this with clients over the years. I, I feel like there's a little bit of a, I don't know, a, a, a dance that does happen that from the client's end, I've given my life savings to this firm. And I feel like I have some obligation and responsibility as the client, as the steward for my own money that every now and then, I should probably check in with them just to make sure they know what the blank they're doing. Like, I didn't trust my life savings. I do want to be a good steward. I don't want to do all that stuff. That's why I hired an advisor. But I feel like I need to do something from time to time to check in and just make sure they're, they're, tending, the sh they're tending the ship. They know what's going on. They're paying attention. Like, just... I need to be reassured that I have made a good decision. And that, that often manifests itself as, hey, I heard this thing on CNBC, the internet, the news thing that prompted on my phone. And like, hey, just wondering what you guys are thinking about this. I mean, I get these questions sometimes yep. from clients that like, I mean, they ask, I'm like, I know you don't actually care about this stuff that much. Right. right, right, why, right. Why are you asking? I don't say it that directly. Why are you asking? But I start thinking, like, why are they asking? And I realize, like, it's it's often this piece. So I'd, I'd kind of break it up into three groups. There's the people who really don't care. And they probably don't read the stuff we said anyways. But there's a group that just doesn't care, the true delegators. There's the group that really does care, right? That subset of clients that are more involved in investment stuff and they want to have this conversation. And then there's this group in the middle that doesn't really care that much, but they feel that they need to ask this question from time to time, and we do have to answer it reasonably. Yeah. Or they're yeah, yeah. gonna get anxious that like they really did hire someone who maybe doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. And so I like to me, that's what that's what pulls this up in the first place. I don't know whether that necessarily means it has to be a quarterly newsletter or a monthly newsletter. There's probably a good discussion about what the timing or cadence should be but i do feel like there's this burden on us that every now and then you gotta show up that and show that you know what you're talking about yeah, and that you I, know what you're doing i told I, I love the word dance i think of it as sort of a righteous trick right <laughs> and and I, I think we've talked about that before like a bait and switch is in service of of me right like i pull bait and switches when i'm tricking somebody but a righteous trick is in service of the client. 
And I, I love this dance. So let me tell you a quick story, if that's okay. Let me just share a quick story. Um, there was a, a, a client, he was referred to me. We shared a lot of the same interests. He loved to mountain bike and backcountry ski and climb and all the same. We, we, and he was referred to me by somebody like that. And um, uh, his name was, what does it call him? Do Dr. Terry is what we'll call him. That's not his name. Um, Dr. Terry was a radiologist. And he, so he came in to meet with me. And as part of the process, near the end of the meeting, you know, we had gone through all that. I got asked really good questions. I almost got him to cry, like that whole thing. Um, and near the end of the meeting, I said, how often in an ideal world, how often would we communicate? Like if we work together, how often would you hear from me in an ideal world? And he said, well, in an ideal world, I'd never hear from you. Right? Like you'd take care of it. I'd ride my bike. I wouldn't even in an ideal world. I'd never like I like you. But in an ideal world, I'd never hear from you. I was like, all right, cool. So we, you know, we, we go through the process, he becomes a client and, and we, you know, pretty intensive stuff up there for the first six months, a year, whatever, we get everything settled and, and we go into this sort of maintenance phase and um, pretty simple, you know, saving a lot of money, doing all the things, everything's right, rebalancing. And, you know, I, I stopped contacting him. In an ideal world, you'd never hear from me. We're in an ideal world. So I'm going to stop. A couple months later, not a couple months, probably like eight, nine months go by, and transfer paperwork shows up. <laughs> and moving like, wow. All of his money is like two and a half million dollars gone, and it's going to, um, yeah, listen, it's going to, it's going to someplace. And, and I was like, I called and I was like, Dr. Terry, what, what's the deal? Like, this is. Like, it's perfect. We've got this plan, you told me. And by the way, if, if you just, he lived, he had moved a little further away from us. He'd moved to, from Utah to Idaho. He moved a little further away. I said, by the way, if it's like a local thing, I will help you find a good financial planner locally. Like, I'm super cool with that. But you are not moving it to this place. Like, you're not, he's like, can you do that? And I said, no, but I'm not, I'm still not. I, I know you and your wife well enough that I'm not going to let you. And I'm like, what's the deal? And he goes, I never hear from you. And I was like, dude, let me show you the words out of your mouth. You said in a real world, you would never, and he's like, I know, I know, I know, but we're not there yet. So I think that's the dance. The dance is you can't actually believe them. Now, I'm not saying we need to send market commentary. That's a separate discussion. But I, you actually, I don't think we can believe them because by them, I mean the human beings that we call our clients because they're humans right? They turn on the radio. The financial pornography yells at them. They think, I should know something. Why hasn't Carl called? You know, I can't believe we're doing nothing. Everybody else seems to be doing stuff. So we have to live in that reality. In a perfect world, they would be detoxed from all that stuff. And many of my clients, and I'm sure you've seen this too, and I bet a bunch of the people who watch this, because they're all like legit financial advisors and financial planners, a bunch of them have, have got clients who are indeed detoxed. We used to call it that. After Terry's experience, Dr. Terry's experience, we would tell people, hey, you know what? Let me just tell you about something that's going to happen to you over the next six to 18 months. We don't know how long it will take, but you have now, and I, this is exactly what I would say, you have now officially entered the financial pornography detox program. And this is what's going to happen. You're going to hear stuff on the radio. You're going to be concerned about it. You're going to call. Occasionally, you're going to hear a hint of annoyance or sarcasm in my responses. And I, and I said, I don't mean it. But there's going to come a day when you will look back on those questions and you will understand why they were kind of funny to me, too. And when we get there, I want to have a party. Like, we'll celebrate high five. You'll know it. You'll know it when you feel it. You'll start looking at the USA Today section. USA Today money section will start becoming the funny section, right? Like, those are the words I would use. And then when they would call in the detox problem, detox program, they'd be like four months in, they would call and say, Carl, what about Bitcoin? Are we? And I would say, I would, I'd be as direct, like you said, no, I wouldn't be that direct. I would, I would, now we've set it up that it's okay to joke about it. I would say, what have you been watching? Like, don't make me send the financial pornography police over to your house, like to pick up the magazines. I would say that. And that's where our newsletter came from, is I would say that. And a client named Rick said to me, after like three or four of those episodes of me threatening to send the financial pornography police over to his house, he would say, Carl, you're always telling me what not to read. 
can you please tell me what I should be reading? Mm -hmm. Right? Like we don't know that you, that you read all about Bitcoin and that you have a formed opinion. We didn't know that. We, we, right. so, so there's an element of, I love your word dance. There's an element of understanding where people are in the detox process. Some people may never totally detox. That's okay. And guess what? Spikes happen based on like crazy, super scary news, right? Like people who I thought were totally detoxed obviously had questions in 2008, right? Like, yeah. you know, it, it, how could you not? And so I think that we, we've turned this, I think this is actually, we should, I don't know if we should spend enough time now to talk about what to send or if we want to do another episode like part two of this. But I think this is really important to understand. This is a dance. Like they're humans. They don't know. We don't know. Like we humans don't know. And, and, and so to have a, a direct conversation about one of our goals is to give you your life back. Right? One of our goals, I have another, let me tell another quick story. There's another guy named, um, what should I call him? Rick. We'll call him Rick. Rick uh, used to spend four hours a week. He calculated this. He used to spend four hours a week, like half an hour a day, you know, a half, well, it was like half an hour, four days a week, plus two hours on the weekend. He'd watch, he'd read the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and then Barron's and Forbes or something. And then he went through a detox process and he woke up one day and realized he wasn't doing that anymore. And he actually calculated. He's like, that's 208 hours a year that I got back. Mm -hmm. right? And he, he went further and said, assume that I sleep, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's like, it's 13 waking days. Like that, you, that, that this detox process has given me back in my life. Like you want to coach your daughter's football team? Right? You want to take a trip? Like you just got 13 awake days, 208 hours back because you detoxed. Like that is so valuable. And yet I think people do need to know. Michael knows about this every time I call him. So instead of being like, what are you reading? Stop doing, stop being stupid. You can say, oh, interesting. You should ask, right? Like, yeah, I've studied that. I'm, you know, let's dive into it a bit and understand we always end up in the same place. The same place is you're allocated correctly, stay the course. 95% of the time, the answer is the same. The answer could be Nick Murray style. Don't do that. Like you could just have an answering machine, <laughs> you know. So that's where I fall on all this. What, 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 what do you think we should do from here, Michael? Uh, so I, I, I think we'll actually let like, what, what do you send? What do you send? to be our, our next episode to follow on this. Cause I think there's a whole interesting discussion unto itself of like, what do you send and is it third party commentary or do you write it yourself and do you have to write it yourself and like how deep should you go? So I think we can, I think we can follow that up uh, in the next episode. Cause the, I don't know the, the, the piece I still want to come back to, I think around just, wrapping up this discussion like i have to admit is as we were getting into it i was expecting i was going to be the one that said yeah you should still send this stuff out and that you were going to be the one that says no no what are you sending all that stuff for so i'm i'm somewhat struck that we're actually ending out in the same place that at least for some period of time you do have to send it you do have to keep sending it i i i find there, there is a crossover point. I think indirectly, it's it's what you pointed out in your in your second story that you know I said earlier. There's sort of three types of clients. Like there's the ones that just delegate and let it go. Those are easy. We kind of know what to do with them. They're not reading the stuff anyways. You can send it to them to feel good about yourself, but they, they're not looking at it. Uh, there's the people who really want to talk investments with you, and and then there's this group in the middle that don't really care that much but they're asking the question because they feel like they have to do it to prove to themselves they're being good stewards of their money and they're being diligent and monitoring you because they gave you the money and 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 we and we do that dance and and what strikes me about those clients is 
there is a crossover point where that ends if you're with them long enough. Um, you know, you were talking about doing this over, like trying to detox them over nine or 18 months. I, you know, when I reflect back in clients of our firm, I, I feel like it's, it's frankly a lot longer than that for most of them. Maybe we need to take some lessons from you, but uh, I, I find it's more like, frankly, probably three to five years. And that at some point in the relationship, like we've worked together so long, we've met so long, we've sat down for so many meetings that what I find happens is just, it suddenly starts getting harder to schedule them for meetings. Right. And, you know, we call them and say, or we touch base them, hey, it's time for the next meeting for you to come on in so we can, you know, check in on your planning stuff and we'll do a portfolio review and, you know, the stuff that we would do in a, in a client meeting. And, and like, they don't return the calls. They don't return the emails to schedule the meeting. And then usually, like, I got to do a follow-up call or someone does a follow-up call and say, like, what's going on? And, right, because at some point you start getting nervous, like, is the transfer paperwork about to show up? And, and we would touch base them. And the answer is, no, no, actually, like, I'm, I'm fine. Look, I'll mm -hmm. call you if there's a problem. And you call me if there's a problem. And short of that... I don't know why we need to keep meeting right now. Like I'm good. And they weren't there at the beginning, right? When you try to take them there too fast, you get the Dr. Terry effect, which is everything seems fine until the transfer paperwork shows up. But there does seem to be some crossover point where you're in the trust zone now. Like you're really in the trust zone. You have, you have truly stepped in the circle of trust. And once you are actually fully in the circle of trust, this stuff starts to melt away. And I, and I think it's that group in the middle that they felt like they had to do something for a period of time to make sure they really picked the right advisor who's doing the right stuff and knows what he or she is talking about and that everything's okay. And then at some point after a couple of years, everything is okay. And they start to relax. Like they start to really relax into the relationship. And then, and then the only ones we're left with are that subset of clients that we, most of us, I think at least have, we certainly have that just, they actually like talking about the investment stuff. They're always going to want to chit chat about every meeting. Like that's part of their thing. That part never ends for them. It's not a huge portion of our clients, but we've got the most advisors I know have some of those, but the rest just start backing off. But I still find like we got to send them stuff regularly to get there like we have to be proactive in the communication and that even when they don't read it and now we can actually tell they don't read it because like we get oh you know statistics on the emails of open rates and <laughs> click rates and things like that like even when they're not reading it you get credit for sending it you get mental credit for sending it my firm knows what they're doing. They're on the ball. I saw there was a headline about the market decline from last week. I didn't even bother reading it because I know they're on top of it, but they sent me something to show that they acknowledged it happened and that I might be anxious about it and that they're on top of it with the communication. And, and I think that stuff still matters as much as I think we'd all like to say, oh, I just never talk about investment stuff with my clients and they never call me and they're always cool and smooth through all the bear markets. I think for most of our clients, we still have to send that stuff at least until we're much further into the trust zone and get them in our circle of trust. And even then, code. It, it still matters. Code, code of trust. trust. And, yeah. and, and even when they're in the cone of trust, it still matters because at some point a volatile market thing happens and even people who've been cool as a cucumber can suddenly freak out. Yeah, I, I actually think that this like don't believe them thing is important. Even the people who say, you know, it appears like Dr. Terry told me, I'd never hear from you. I don't need to hear from you. Like, I, I think it does now. Now, what we send and the length of what we send will be in the next episode. And we'll talk in depth about that. But I think, let me just uh, like one last story. To this. Well, there's two important things I want to just, in terms of my like closing remarks, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, wrap, wrap us up. Like, what's, what's two, the takeaways that we should have out of this? One is that I think you should, I really feel like, and we've been, sort of teaching this for a long time that that 
you should set that experience up before it happened. Like, in other words, you should have a conversation with brand new client mm -hmm. that says there will be a day when this thing happens. Mm. Now use whatever you were. I liked calling it the financial detox program because I thought it was fun and it kept things light and people relaxed a bit. You call it whatever you want, but I think you have that client, that conversation because it sets it up when they get there. Here's what, here's what I think one of our great fears is, is like, Oh, when we go into maintenance, there's nothing for us to do. And clients will see that as like, why am I still paying you? I think you be, proactive and on the offense about that and demonstrate that's actually when we become the most valuable by saying, when you get this point, we're going to have a party. Like I want to know we're at high fives because we'll know I, this is exactly the words that I would use you. We will know that at that point, our relationship has become really valuable. Right. And it may take us six months. It may take us five years, but if we get to the point where you're no longer worried about it and you're saying, if there's something important, Carl would have called. And you, you know, like that is, that's real value, high fives all the way around, right? Like, so you're setting it up early on that when we get to the point where we no longer have to talk all that much, we've actually, our value hasn't gone down, it's gone up. So that's number one. Number two is, let me just, last story. I had client advisory council. I used to call clients every month. They would get a day in the month. So I remember like Dan Ford's day was the second Tuesday of the month. Second two, he didn't know that. But on the second Tuesday, I'd walk in, there'd be Dan Ford's folder, and there was like seven other folders that were that day, and I would pick up Dan Ford's folder, I would review it, I would go through the 17-point wealth management audit or whatever the, we called it, and I would look down and how statements are householded, you know, like all those things rebalanced on tar target, like blah, blah, blah. I would initial them, check them, and then I would call. I'd say, hey, we performed our 17-point wealth management audit, Everything's fine. You do that month after month after month after month. And the answer was always the same. Everything's fine. Month after month. Sometimes we just, you know, leave a voicemail or send an email. So I met with client advisory council. Dan was on the client advisory council. Some others were. They were like my top clients. And we used to meet once a, or twice a year. And um, I asked them, we've been doing this thing for like three years. We call every month. It's almost always the same. Everything's fine because we actively rebalance. We do all the things. We do all the stuff. And we, but we still call you. I'm wondering, do you still, you know, like, should we just make these quarterly? And I fully expected them to be like, yeah, we don't need to hear from you. My best clients all said, no, we love getting that phone call. Even if we don't answer, we just love knowing that somebody was on top of it. That's all like, just an email that says, we looked at your stuff. Your stuff is okay. Please keep doing that. So to me, I think like, don't believe them. Set up some system that works for you. Maybe it's quarterly. I'm not suggesting monthly. Maybe it's quarterly. Maybe it's twice a year. Maybe it's fortnightly. Like maybe it's weekly. Maybe it's daily. I don't, I don't know. Whatever your deal is, name it. Set it up as a value, part of your value proposition. And then deliver it. And when they say they don't need to hear it anymore, just go, okay, cool. And then keep doing it. Yeah. I, yeah. I feel like there's sort of this piece of, you know, ask them if they want the stuff, then don't believe them when they say no and send it to them anyways. And you do that until you get them to the cone of trust That's right. when everything's okay. And high the, five. the cone of trust and you can high five in the cone of trust then still keep doing it anyways, even though they're definitely not going to be reading it now because the fact that you sent something they don't read still checks a mental box for them that Somebody it's that. okay I'm not reading this because Carl wrote it and I know that means he's spending the time and energy thinking about this thing, which means I don't actually need to read it because he wrote it, but I would be worried if he didn't. Amen. And by the way, just so we're not confused and the next step and you don't listen to the next episode, we haven't really said anything about market commentary here. Like that may or may not include, we've been talking about client commentary. Like okay. Client, so client situation. it may or may not include, you know, like, Hey, I know the markets are rough. Like it just is like, Hey, I looked at your stuff. Your stuff is okay. Well, that's quite a lob for episode 13. Like, now we have to keep going on the next episode. Like, you can't end yeah. here because 
like this is the closest thing you get to a Kitsis and Carl cliffhanger. Right, That's right. Here. This, this. I mean, I don't know about games. Whatever that thing is, Game of Thrones or something. This is. I mean, why would you? You better tune in to Kitsis and Carl episode thirteen. Tune in in two weeks for Kitsis and Carl episode thirteen, where we will finally actually get to the question from about a half an hour ago about market commentary, because we will get there now that we have journeyed to the cone of trust. That's right. Amen, Michael. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Carl. Okay, bye.